What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of the Curfew Boys. Before we get this started, if you like what you hear, you can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Music, and any platform, any well, podcast. <laughs> We're not cutting that. <laughs> any podcast platform you have and what like to listen to, you can watch us on YouTube. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And if you like what you hear or don't like what you hear, we want to hear your honest uh, review and opinion on us. So please give us a rating and um, write a review. Anything that can help us grow and give you better content. On that note, I'm your host tonight, Anxious Anthony, and we got GQ Chris in the house. Hey now. Hey now. How you doing? Not too bad. This is the third time I'm trying this episode so um, I'm really off tonight, but it's okay. Like the Habs, off off game, but uh, we are short staff tonight. We got uh, Fireman Sam, who is actually on duty right now uh, at the firehouse, probably on the road doing his fireman duties. We got Chipman Adri stuffing himself with chips for sure because he hasn't been on in a while, but he's very busy with family, kids, and eating a lot of chips for sure. We got Joy, which has no reason to not be on this episode. But whatever, Joy, we forgive you. Rams still suck. And we got Baseman Zook, who couldn't make it tonight as well. But they're all here in spirit. Chris, absolutely. how you doing, my man? Pretty Rams, good. Oh, pretty sorry, good. Let me, let me say that again. GQ, Chris, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well. You know what? This is going to be pretty interesting. This guy, this little this little guy, he's only six months old. He keeps jumping on me. He really likes the wire. So if ever in the middle of the episode, this might be a little bit more beneficial for uh, individuals who want to watch this episode on YouTube. You might see my cat attack me. You might hear a scream when he sinks his claws into my legs. That is very much what's go- going on and what's new in uh, in my household. How about you? That's probably very good content for YouTube. If a cat starts attacking you live on an episode, <laughs> we can start getting high re- views on this episode because <laughs> of that. Uh, how about me? I mean, uh, looking forward to the weekend. Um, leaving to Florida in two days uh, to catch a Patriots Miami game in Miami. So I'll be in sunny wow. state, Florida. Looking forward to that. Trying to catch a Florida Seattle game on Saturday night. Never seen the Habs play outside of Montreal. Scratch that. I've seen them at the Canadian Tire Center. Uh, but, you know, you can call that the Bell Center because uh, 90% fans are Hab fans. 10% Leafs fans. But I believe those 10, that 10% is probably the staff, right? Um, <laughs> but I've always wanted to see a, an NHL game outside of the Bell Center. So it's too bad the Montreal Canadiens are not playing in Florida uh, this weekend. But, hey. I'll try to catch a game and wear a Habs jersey and support the Habs in a Florida Seattle game. Probably get shot, but we'll see what happens. That's that honestly sounds awesome. I think number one, uh, the Florida atmosphere might be a little bit of a uh, calmer one than what we're used to here in Montreal. But nevertheless, you're going to get to watch some quality hockey. And then uh, let's let's not skip over the NFL game. Like as much as we as much as we talk hockey, I can only imagine that's going to be absolutely awesome. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. I mean, um, I know last episode I, I straight out said to Joey just to make him happy that the pads suck this year, and um, which they do. Uh, but they had a very good game last week, so there's a bit of hope for a nice comeback, potential comeback. So I'm looking forward to this game. If we can win a division game, uh, we have some hope to at least try to make wild cards. Joey's listening to this episode and he's dying of laughter because he's like, what kind of drugs am I smoking right now to even think that the Patriots have a chance to make wild card? But hey, it's me, Anthony, who always has hope for everybody, right? I always think that the Munchak are going to win the playoffs or win the Stanley Cup in two, three years. And I'm still waiting and still hoping. And now I'm hoping for the Patriots to come back again. Anthony with so much hope. But, you know, in life, you got to just have positive uh, vibes and positive attitude and you never know. Things can I think I think I'm right on board with you. I think sometimes even in my predictions and whatever I go about saying, I'm a little bit optimistic. Uh, you know, if we want to kick start this episode and transition into our beloved Montreal Canadiens, I think a, a good one to reflect upon was my prediction that I had for the injuries. I said, mathematically speaking, we should not be seeing as many injuries this year as we have Last year, and lo and behold, Kirby Doc second game of the season gone. Uh, you have you have then Caden Gooley who goes down. Now we have a confirmed um, 
David Savard, who's going to be out for six to eight weeks. Like, what the hell? I think it's time for an exorcism. There's a, there's a curse. There's something that's going there's on. Something over going here on. It makes no sense. We had said it last year. You know, like after so many injuries that we had last year, and then they fire all of these the training the the the, the, the training staffs. Um, not training staff, but you know the doctors and everybody. And you know we were six games in and already three big injuries. And it's just very unfortunate because it's like it's not these random players getting injured. It's players who have strong potential this season. You know, Doc had a crazy uh, uh, preseason, had a first mm-hmm. amazing two games, and then boom, collapse. Gooley, we thought he was going to have a great season this year. Boom, collapsed. Cannot collapse, but you know what I mean? And then Savard, crazy to say this out loud. Probably Joey is mad right now by me mm-hmm. saying this out loud. And But Sammy brought it up in our conversation a few days ago. You know, Savard played a very good game last night against the Sabres. A fantastic game. And again, he's not our number one fucking defenseman, but he played well. And then again, injured. So all these players who are showing great potential to exceed this season are just dropping like flies. And it's just too early, especially after what we went through last year and the change, you know, in in the back office, thinking that this is going to help. But again, it could be just bad luck or just jinx to this team. I don't know what it is, but I don't know. I, I honestly, but sorry, I know you want to say something, but Zook brought up a very, I mean, he brought up a good point earlier today. I'll, I'll read what he said. Word for word, this is uh, Zook's theory. So he wrote, I have a theory about why we're the most, I don't know. It was penalized team. Penalized. Okay, he thought we'll, it was. We'll talk, we'll talk yeah, that's another this. thing to talk about. Right, another thing to talk about. We'll bring that Zook's quote when we talk about that part of it. But finish your your point on the injuries, and then we'll jump on uh, the last three games because we haven't recorded since the loss of Minnesota. So we have some good things to talk about, and of course, bad things. But I think just to quickly sum it up for the injuries, if I'm looking yeah. at what happened, especially to Gooley and what happened to a Kirby Doc. I think, uh, like David Savard, uh, that's why I put him aside. It's it's kind of a freak shot block, injured his hand. It's gonna happen. We've we've seen it happen across the no no matter who. It just occurs sadly, and and of course it had to happen to us. It just naturally, uh, it's almost as though he had it coming. But on the on the flip side of things, I think that the Canadians players like I look at Slavkovsky, I look at how Doc got injured. I look at how Gooley, Gooley, maybe you can make the argument that what I'm about to say is completely false and doesn't apply. But I think the Canadians and and the players truly have to, the players truly have to, guess who's back? Um, the players have to do a better job of protecting themselves. And when I say protecting themselves, again, I see them along the boards and they put themselves in these vulnerable spots. They don't brace for impact. There are only a handful of players who are extremely cautious. Like, I'm going to take two names, and it's two completely different players. You have Arbor Jackeye. This guy's always bracing for impact, always ready, because this guy is dishing it out, and he's ready. He's ready to, to get hit, and he's always mindful. But then they'll take the other extreme. You have Cole Caulfield. I think that's a guy who he's always been a smaller player always been a little bit more on the vulnerable side, would have gotten absolutely killed at every single level that he played at had he not been cautious. And then you look at a guy like Kirby Doc and and, and, and Gooley. And again, with Gooley, the argument could go maybe either way. But I just want to say these are guys that were bigger than the majority of the competition that they were playing against. They didn't have to be mindful of these things. And you think Kirby Doc flying down the wing, he never thought in a million years that Tenorti was going to take him out. wasn't very mindful of that. Uh, Gooley, again, it's not a huge impact or contact or anything that's crazy. It's simply the fact that you have a guy who maybe just didn't brace himself when coming into contact and not in the habit of doing so. So all to say, I'm, I'm no coach. I'm no trainer. I don't work for the organization. But when I look at these guys, I don't see them going out of their way to protect themselves and to make sure that they're absorbing these contacts in the right way. So I'll leave it at that. And, uh, and from there, I guess it would be a good time to go over kind of the past few games and what's been going on. 
All right, so we're six. So we have valid points there, uh, um, Chris. And I'll I'll kind of link that to, you know, the next topic after about the penalties. But let's just you know summarize what happened in the last three games. So we're six games in. I don't think we have a really bad record for the start. Usually we, you know, the Habs usually have a good record in October, um, but sometimes have a bad start. This time along, uh, this this year so far, were three wins, two losses after tonight's game, and uh, one overtime loss. Not bad of a record compared to thinking, like, you know, considering what we expected the season's going to be like, right? Um, last three games after that Minnesota, dist- like us getting destroyed by Minnesota <laughs> 5-2, I think, that, that, I think we answered back fairly well. In the sense that, you know, we beat the Washington Capitals at home, you know, against Ovechkin, right? Coming from a loss of 5-2 against Minnesota, you might not be as motivated. And then you're playing against Ovechkin and the, and the Washington Capitals. I thought we would have got destroyed that game. I'll be honest with you. I, don't, I didn't think we would have came out strong. But I'm really happy to see the boys, you know, coming back the way they did uh, from a loss uh, from 5-2. And shutting down Ovechkin. I think so. And like to kind of the one correction I'm going to make, I hate to be the uh, the person to to do so, but Washington, they did play here in Montreal, actually. But nevertheless, I find that Washington plays well against Montreal here at the Bell Center. I find that Minnesota always plays extremely well against us. I don't know why. Um, but other than the Minnesota game, and I'm talking about tonight's game against Jersey that we lost included, I think the the Canadians were were competitive at times, even dominant, and and they weren't outclassed in any single game. Don't get me wrong, Jake Allen had a hell of a game against uh, against Buffalo. If like if I could summarize, if I could summarize each one of the games in maybe a handful of words, I think team effort against the Caps. Jake Allen was the story <laughs> against Buffalo. Um, tonight was basically the star power, New Jersey star power and power plays, which is going to be a great transition. And then for, for Minnesota, it was just asleep at the wheel or never showed up to the bell center. So just to backtrack a little bit, you said about, you know, the uh, Habs dominating and stuff. Look, I'm not going to take away our wins. We played very well. We won, you know. But I think Jake Allen is who saved us with Washington and who saved us with Buffalo, okay? I don't find that we were too offensive, especially yesterday's game. Like, the first period, we ended the period with four shots on net. And if you notice, the first three shots came the first four, uh, six minutes of the game. At the 14-minute mark, we were at three shots. We only took our fourth shot with two minutes left of the first period, right? So yeah. t- like almost 13 minutes or 12 minutes, whatever the math is, because whatever. One sh- <laughs> Let's start over, you know, 14 minute mark. <laughs> that's six minutes in. We scored. We took three shots at mm-hmm. the two minute mark. We took our fourth shot. That's insane. That That's horrible. Yeah. Right. And then we bounce back mid second period because when the second period started, our fifth shot, which was the first shot in the second period, came in three minutes into the second period. We were sitting at five shots with the first five minutes of the second period. It made zero sense of we had no like no offensive, like no offensive magic, nothing. There was nothing yeah. happening. And Jake Allen was just on fire, stopping every shot. The guy was playing like an elite goalie. You know? <laughs> I wish I wish they would have zoomed into his face just to make sure that it wasn't carry under that mask. But, but you, you know what I mean? Like you, but again, and I think we said it yesterday, it was, it was Jake Allen who saved us yesterday. Now we finally woke up in the second and third period and we scored. Um, let me just go back and I completely forgot the score of last night, but yeah, we, we won three, one, you know, we three came one. back. It was very well. Um, I love that Tanner Pearson scored just to, you know, <laughs> bust Joey's chops. Cause I started the season by saying that I had a good feeling with Tanner Pearson this season. And he's been playing very well. 
I think he has one of the most. I think does he have the most uh, goals this in our in He's our team? He's tied. Right? New Hook, New Hook, Caulfield, and uh, and Pearson are all tied with three. See, Joy. You go. Pearson and Caulfield have the same amount of goals, man. That's that's insane. But uh, but yeah, um, again, I'll just repeat this one last time. Jake Allen really saved us in the first, you know, those two, last two games. But then we transitioned to tonight, and we started off very strong. I think we had like ten shots in the first period. We attacked like crazy. We scored a beautiful goal. But let's now transition to the real topic here: what's causing the lack of shots, and what's causing us not being that offensive? What is it? And even bringing about the losses, they're they're constantly getting into penalty trouble and yeah, penalty trouble in the offensive zone. And Anthony, this is a comment that you've put a million times in the group chat. I, I want to give this to you. Uh, you pointed it out the most, but in the offensive zone, how many penalties is this team going to take? Like, just fucking ease up. Like with your poke check, with your grabbing, just let the guy go, Christ. So not including tonight's game. And with tonight's game, we are now the most penalized team in the NHL. But just, just because I don't have the stats of tonight, we are sit- we were sitting with 39 penalties in five games. 39 penalties in five games, yeah. okay? Yeah, now Carolina sat- was sitting with 43 penalties but with seven games, so they had two games ahead of us. And at seven games, they were at 43. We were at 39 with five. We're now at sitting at game six, and we are known as the most penalized team. I don't know what the problem is. And like you said, it's not only defensive penalties. We're even getting offensive penalties. Like, what is going on? Like, we're not disciplined whatsoever. Yep. Now, I understand it's, the first two games, you're trying to adjust to the game, you're trying to adjust to the new players, the rookies are trying to adjust to the league, all that stuff. But you're with Marty. Marty is your coach. You're not talking about this in the dressing room? Try to find ways to be more disciplined. Stop doing this. And we're just constantly getting these penalties. And that's what's causing, again, I said it before, five, sh- uh, four shots in, in, in the whole period. And no shots in 12 minutes, whatever you kiss me. But why? You're you're sitting 90% of the game in your own offensive zone. Uh, sorry, your own defensive zone because the other team is attacking with all these power plays. And I think tonight in the third period against New Jersey, New Jersey had eight minutes offensive time zone. They, were, yeah. uh, they had the puck for eight minutes in our zone. Eight minutes out of 20 minutes. You have 12, you know what I mean? Like, how do you yeah. how do you expect to score? How do you expect to win? How do you expect to shoot? No, ex- exactly that. It's and you kill your momentum. You whatever you're building, you're taxing the same players over and over because it's going to be the same penalty killers. And all in all, I think I want to I want to say it comes from something positive, in that the guys are very motivated. I'm gonna I'm gonna go on like. When there are defensive penalties, you trip a guy, something like that happens. It's to be expected. Every single team is going to get those defensive penalties. Sometimes I think it's even worthwhile to take one of those penalties rather than, let's say, let a two-on-one or a three-on-one go by. Like, take the penalty and and it actually might be beneficial. You have a better likelihood of, of killing it off. But on the other on the other side of things, Romy, Jesus... And he's on this. He's on the space bar. Um, yeah. Um, going back, I, I apologize for that. But going back to that thought, I think the guys are just highly motivated. They're forechecking extremely hard. Like the defense, the, like I said, the defensive penalties put them out the window. But the forechecking penalties, I think you have motivated young guys who just want to form. But I think somebody just needs to take tell them take a step back and like. Face them on the on the like the the counter rush or like as they're coming back towards our own defensive zone. I I don't know. It's it's like they're chasing them around the net. They're going for like these over the top hits. They're going, you know, it's it's too much. You you literally he has the opportunity to say, guys, we want you to do less. We want you guys to stay in close proximity, but don't fucking go for a mugging. Don't go like wrapping yourself around the so, guy. Okay. 
that that comes aggressively poke checking hitting like well that goes to say like you're you're right about you know the motivation and the way they're playing like they're very offensive attack 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 and there's that lack of discipline because of maybe they're young they're they're rookies and they're trying to learn the process i don't know what it is but there's some and again you could maybe say some of those penalties are coming from that motivation but there's some stupid ones like i don't know if you noticed in the third period tonight against new jersey there was they were in a defensive zone and Jack I just went around him, but instead of like going around, he took him by his shoulder by the back and pulled him down. Yeah. What was, there was it, that was Why? not necessary. Why? That was not necessary. So put a motivation aside and offensive uh, mindset aside, that was just so stupid. And yeah. that to me is lack of discipline. So me, so I will I'm sorry, I love Marty, but I'm gonna start, I'm gonna point the finger at him here. Because if you're gonna cause stupid penalties like that. Then you should get penalized in the dressing room, you know, get mad at the players, you know, penalize them so they don't do this again. Because, again, there's certain penalties that are just it happens, right? You can't control them because it's in the game. It's You're in that play. You're in that moment, uh, high momentum, whatever you want to call it. But then there's stupid penalties like that that should not be caused. And that's what changes the whole momentum of the game. That have started very strong tonight, you know. Yeah, what a yeah. beautiful goal from from Pozzetta and uh, and Baron. Okay, mm-hmm. that that shot from Pozzetta, the rebound from Baron, it was just beautiful. We were a high, the momentum was high, especially with yep. Primo, who was, I believe, that was just Carey Price behind that mask, right? The first period save of the year, I believe, is the save of the year for the whole NHL. I mean, and still early to to say that, but that is top five save at the moment. And that Absolutely. will be in highlights all year. And Primo was just on fire in the first period. But then that first penalty that came from the Montreal Canadiens, that caused New Jersey to score. And then forget it. Your momentum completely drops. And your your goalie is playing on a high. You want to keep that momentum going. You don't want to like destroy this guy's momentum, especially Primo, who had a bad start in his career. All, we all had high hopes for him. Now we're we put we don't want to put him on waivers because you know you're gonna get picked up for free. His first NHL game this season, the guy comes out hot. He's yeah. he, just the first period. His value skyrocketed, and I don't believe that the score tonight is his fault. I yeah. I'm gonna point fingers at the team getting penalized the way they they they, they were just sitting in the penalty box most of the game. So you can't point fingers at Primo. You know what I mean? So I I, I point fingers right now at the team and Marty for the the lack of discipline. And that's, I'm going to say it outright too, uh, based off the injuries that we spoke about. If they're going to be getting these freaking penalties, don't forget that you lost. And and this much, the guy is worth his weight in gold. Without David Savard, get ready because penalty killing is going to be a whole lot harder. And a whole like that their their PK percentage is gonna likely dip down. And so, like you're saying, just these stupid penalties that are avoidable, grow up. I know they're kids, I know we have to be patient, and I'm I'm more than willing to be patient. It's just be smart about it, guys. Like they like you said, it's on Marty and and his staff. They could easily pull this aside and they can they could kind of make it a fun like I think if I were coaching in the NHL don't be like a stretch of the imagination uh, Chris like calm down stop dreaming but just just to say you pull it aside you maybe make it something funny like what was going on in your mind like what were you thinking were you that pissed off at the guy Jack guy and and they're laughing as they as the whole team watches them yank down and and what were you doing here what was this play why did you go for that hit uh, when the guy had his back turned, why did you poke check so aggressively? Like, you know, it's stuff that's easy to point out, st- stuff that's easy to correct. It's just a question of calming down and and being a little bit more even keel emotionally. I think during the uh, during the game. But anyhow, yeah, we'll, that, we'll see that what needs comes to, of it. That needs to be fixed. And and if you're not gonna fix that, I mean, if you had a good penalty kill. Then maybe you can afford to have some penalties caused, right? But you know, we're sitting in that penalty box and we're allowing goals to come in. So that's gonna 
uh, that's going to, you know, we're playing somewhat well. You know, we're getting some wins. These losses, I blame the penalties. So we need to fix that right away. Not only that, our power play is horrible still. Like, oh, the, the and you said it right before, and, 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 and that's another thing. So not only are we bad on the penalty kill, we're, <laughs> we're finding ourselves in the penalty box, letting goals go in. Then we get a power play. And yeah. look, for example, was it? Was it yesterday's game where we had like two back-to-back five-on-threes? Five-on-threes, yeah, right. that were squandered. And uh, well, sorry, it wasn't. Sorry, that wasn't the game that we're thinking of. It was Washington. Washington, we let them climb back and come back into the game. Yeah, and that was a game that we had two five-on-threes, and it. we should have put it away before the end of the game. Washington should have never gotten that loser point in in OT. Okay, so yes, that game there, we I remember AJ saying that we should have lost. You know what? I, I agree with him at that point because, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm happy we won, of course, but we had an opportunity to close that game shut. You know, yep. back-to-back five-on-threes, we don't score anything on that. We make Washington tie the game, we, we and we, we, we blow a two-goal lead again, right? Was it a two-goal yep. lead? Yeah, we blew yep. that two-goal lead. We don't capitalize on our power plays. Two back-to-back five-on-threes, we don't capitalize at all. Washington has a game. Thank God we have Caulfield who scored that beautiful goal in, in overtime to win that game. Those two points, we're freaking lucky we got them. Even though we played well in the game, I think the end, we just did not deserve it the way we finished the game off. But whatever, it is what it is. Happy we got those two points. But if this if this is happening early on the season, man, we're going to have a fucking long season because yeah. there is a lot of potential with this team. Again, we're yeah. not a contending team. I don't see us winning the Stanley Cup, but what we've seen so far, there's a lot of good. But the bad is taking, you know, is is masking the good right now with with all that's happening. And I think this team needs to regroup, get more disciplined, and start strengthening our weaknesses. And again, it, it's going to take a while, and. I think the main thing right now is we need to get more discipline and help and fix those power plays because come playoffs, if we do make it, if you don't fix those two key things, yeah. we're just, what's we're the point done. of making playoffs? You're going to get destroyed the first four games because yep. power play goals are key. That's that's what adds momentum to your game and capitalize on you know closing out games early. And penalty kills also key because if you can stop them or not get fucking penalties, it, 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 it avoids giving an advantage to the other team, right? So all these things, these are factors that we, we keep talking about year over year, and it's just, again, not getting fixed. And I don't know. I, I don't know what more to say to that. I think, well, look, we we covered the PK element. Smarten up, be a little bit more responsible, be a little bit more aware of what's going on around. And I think that's an easy fix. The power play, I'd like to say that it's an easy fix, whereas I don't think it's as easy as we'd we'd like it to be. But the one thing is that like when you're talking about drawing on positives, number one, you have a guy like Jack Eye who's and, and Pezzetta. I have to say, like I was pretty I tough Pizzetta. on Pezzetta. I was I wasn't so sure whether or not he had a spot in the lineup. He has had an incredible impact on like the hitting, the, the the emotion and everything that goes on in the middle of the game, like Pezzetta has, has, has been very key. And I think we have a team that's frustrating, like that frustrates other teams physically. And then the second element is that our team is very fast. So we do draw a lot of penalties and we have those opportunities. But when you have these, those opportunities, why are they not capitalizing? I want to go back to something that came... That 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 happened uh, in tonight's game was spectacular. We're going to be seeing it on replays over and over again. But why does it tie back? Not only yeah, it happened on the power play. Mike Matheson, end to end goal, end to end beauty. Splits the D, goes two hundred feet and scores a goal. Romy, Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, so he's going to stay here for, for this point, but Matheson was allowed to do that. Why? The whole fucking New Jersey Devils team was just waiting for him to drop it back and for Suzuki to take the puck 
and and skate it up the ice and either just get it through past over the blue line and make a pass or get it into the get into the offensive zone and kind of shoot it in for let's say a guy like Josh Anderson, Tanner Pearson or any other player to go to go fish it out of the corner. But that being said, lo and behold the one fucking time that our team does not do that stupid drop pass he goes end to end. It was such a surprise for the it other team. It was a team beautiful that, goal. And it, it was, was a surprise goal. to the team, and it was a surprise to us. Like because watching that play, I was—I don't know about you, but I was waiting for the drop back. And and yeah. you said it yourself. Even the Devils were waiting for the drop back, so they just stood there, and we finally surprised the other team, which, you know, because teams study each other, right? And and they and the teams know how. The Montreal Canadiens work their power play. They've been doing it for years now. This stupid drop back pass thing. And tonight, Matheson surprised everybody, including us, watching this this play. And what a beautiful goal it was. So now yep. we need to – you said it before we started recording. That worked. So now you yep. know what works. Take it yep. and, 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 and now st- start – finding plays that are similar to that play because you know you can score this way you can we have a, a fast team we finally have a team that can enter the zone with with, with yes. speed so that's that's what i want to that's where I, I like i'm i'm busting I, on the inside I'm, I'm literally like dying to, to 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 talk about this specific point obviously and and i know you in that sense, you completely agree. We're not going to be able to score end-to-end rushes no, on, it's, on it's the it's game. It's game always happen, but yeah. But it's enough. Like, you take any team. You take any good team. And I, I want to go to the guys who have been so present in the past few years. Whether it's Kale, like, I'll, I'll go I'll go both Tampa and Colorado. You take Colorado, you can have Kale McCarr, who's skating it into the zone. You can have... Um, uh, well, Nathan McKinnon skating into the zone. You don't know what's coming. You genuinely don't know. Okay, are they going to drop it? What's going? The Habs. It was a hundred percent. It was literally one hundred percent. Other than the Matheson goal, a hundred percent of the zone entries for the Montreal Canadiens on the power play were Nick Suzuki carrying them in on on the on the first wave and. Oftentimes, or Kirby Doc, maybe who was doing it for the the two games or one and a half games that he wasn't uh, that he wasn't injured, and I'm trying to think who else. Sometimes Matheson seems to be skating it in as well, uh, but it's always the same formation: four guys going in with no speed, practically waiting at the blue line. Just a, a cluster, pardon the expression, and it's a lot of swearing, but it was just a cluster fuck right at the blue line. He's basically, whoever's carrying the puck, the, one of the three guys who was known to carry the puck, is just looking for a small little hole. I'm, I'm fearful that one of our guys, another one of our guys is going to get injured, getting absolutely smashed. It's just time, when you say change the zone entry, just at least have two to three to four different options. If it's one of the four... It still forces the opponent to react differently. It still forces them to position themselves differently. They don't know what's coming. But for the whole entirety, I know it's been six games, but for the entirety of the season and the entirety of last season, and I think even a part of the season before, it's the same shit. Draw the pass. And and the league knows it. They can read their plays. But I believe, and we, we spoke about this last episode, with the team that we have right now, we have speed, yep. so we can enter the zone. I believe that we have the talent to enter the zone with our speed. Yep. And I, I can't believe I'm saying this, and I said this last episode, but I couldn't stand the dump and chase, and I cannot stand the pug, the the, um, the drop pass. Okay, can't, those are the two things I cannot stand. But at this point, because we finally have a speedy team. I believe that if you want to go back to the dump and chase, not always, you know, you got to spice it up every game because you don't want the other team to always read play over play, right? So if you are a team that could, you know, one moment drop pass, one moment enter the zone, one moment uh, dump and chase, 
it will confuse the whole fucking league. And that's yeah. where you can start scoring some goals and 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 spice up your your um your your power play. Again, I don't want to go dump and chase, but right now with the team that we have, the fucking drop pass is not working. Try to dump yeah. the piece again or find a way to enter the fucking zone. I don't know, but spice it up because right now, if me, a guy who doesn't play in the NHL or doesn't play hockey, can re- know what you're about to do, and if I was on the ice, I'm able to stop that play, then there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Yeah. And tonight is proof that if you can spice it up and finally change your ways – of entering the zone, you can potentially score a goal, and Madison proved that tonight. So yeah. I'm really hoping that they go back on the drawing board at tomorrow's practice or whatever, and and find a different way to, to to enter the zone. But not only that, not only do we have speed, we also have size. Now, if we can, we're able to enter the zone with the speed and that size to stop the other defenseman stopping us from entering. Mm-hmm. Again, we have so much tools that we can use, and they're not using it. They're not. They're well, not strengthening what the positives that they could potentially have. It does it come down to them just having, and that's that's a good maybe thought, and a reassuring one at that too. What if they're just young, and they're still, you know, some maturing, some settling. I don't in believe terms that. of being in the that's, NHL, that's, let's let's hope that they could use their tools. That's that's all. No, but see, okay, I get it. They're young and they don't have experience, but that's not up to the the, the players. It's the coach, mm-hmm. right? The, it's the coach that decides the plays, right? They're they're practicing the power play, the penalty kills are at practice. Now, I'm, right now, from what I'm I'm under, what we're all seeing is at practice they're just practicing the drop pass. They're not practicing anything else. Because all they're doing every fucking game is the drop pass. So are they learning different things? I I, I don't believe they are. I'm going to say this much, okay? Look at the Montreal Canadiens coaching staff on the overall. I love Marty. I would not change. I would never never, change our head coach. Never. But I look at Stefan Rabida. I look at Alexandre Burroughs. And the first thing that comes to mind, sadly, is that they don't have enough experience behind the bench. And, and, and like, uh, Burroughs obviously has a little bit more of an eye on him right now because the power play is evidently not working out. So, you know, like, without shitting on him more, I know that he's got a little bit more of a, um, a focus. But I, I'm just throwing this out there, Okay. For, for for maybe the fans, for, for even us to consider. Would you think it would be beneficial? And, and this is going to sound really maybe ridiculous. And you go, what the hell? You look at Bruce Boudreaux. He was with the Washington Capitals when they were dominating on the power play. They had, obviously, they had Alex Ovechkin in his prime years when he was scoring 50, 60 goals in a given season. But would it not maybe be a worthwhile idea to consider bringing in a veteran coach because the little details, Marty's got the, the style, the theory, how we're going to approach it. But the little, like the little details, the little stupid details, I think it would be very, very, very smart of them. I I, I, a, I agree. An and, and I agree with that statement because look, we have a young team. That needs to grow experience, right? And we 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 established that 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 statement in the in past episodes where this is a team that they're young and they're gonna grow together and they're gonna build experience together and and, and a, a chemistry together and a dynamic whatever. Okay. But you cannot have both young team and young coaching staff. You cannot have a not expert uh, no expertise on the ice and no expertise behind the bench. Right, you cannot have that because then it's not going to work. You need to have a balance, and right now we don't have that because you have a bunch of players, not many veterans on the ice, and you have no veterans behind the bench. Now, I'm not pointing fingers at Marty, I'm not saying he's doing a bad job, but he is considered a rookie coach because he never coached in his life, right? But he's been showing good stuff. But then you go hire Burroughs two years ago, whatever. 
because he was a good power play guy on the ice. Doesn't necessarily mean it works behind the bench. Look, let's, Wayne Gretzky was one of the best fucking players in the league till this day. Yeah. Still the best player in the NHL, but he was a shitty fucking coach. Well, you let's also I mean? so, put things into perspective in the sense that he was fucking playing with Henrik and Daniel Sedin. He literally had to be a standing pylon and shoot the puck when he got it. Like, yeah, okay, he made some good passes. I'm going to give credit where credit was due. He wasn't a bad player. But when you play with those guys, yeah, maybe he absorbed some of the things, but, but don't that's tell what I'm me. You like, play. no, exactly. But that's my point. You don't go hire someone who was good on the power play to be a coach and expect the team to. Be. And again, it's not working. It's not working. I'm sorry, but you know, when they first signed them, I was excited. I'm like, okay, we finally have a guy who knows what he's doing, whatever, blah blah blah. But again, it's what three seasons now. He's our our coach. Is it three? I believe. I just want to uh, make sure. I think, well, right. I think this is. I think this is his third season or second and a half i want to confirm because that, while, uh... while, while you ch while you check that the other name that's popping up like bruce boudreau was just he, he was years. a nice guy and like i wouldn't want him necessarily and i don't know if he would gel with marty but one of the guys and, and everybody's gonna lose their shit when i say this but one of the guys you think about the montreal canadians they they were a, they were a fringe playoff team, unfortunately. But when Koivu, Kovalev, uh, Kostitsin, Plekanec, and these guys were were dominating, Guy Carboneau had a killer power play, absolutely freaking killer power play system. And again, are you gonna con are you gonna get Guy Carboneau back behind the bench as an assistant coach? Doubtful. But they have to. I think it's. I think it's going to be a worthwhile thought for them to start considering. They need to find a veteran, a, ver a veteran assistant coach. I'm not saying I don't want to move around. We said it before. We all like Marty. Can I don't think he should be touched right now. I think he's proving himself, and and I think we have the team loves to play with him, so that's not an issue. But I think we. He's still young. He's still considered a rookie coach to all of us. Um, we still we need a veteran in the back. We need a veteran yeah. who knows what he's doing that can you know, that can help Marty and can help the team because right now having rookies and young coaches staff on the back, it's not helping. It's not helping and we need to find that balance. Um, but yeah, I, I think those are key things that need to fix on. I know it's still early on. We still have a long season ahead of us, but we still have a good record at the moment. We're yes. not, we don't, it's not bad at all. It's three, two, and one. It's very good. But if you want to start winning games, you need to stop going into that penalty box. We need to start scoring power play goals and fix those mistakes. Question for you now. Sure. And again, I don't want to point fingers at him for the loss tonight because it's not his fault at all. But Caden Primo tonight really came out strong and showed a lot of good signs of what he is capable of doing. And I've said this before. I strongly believe that Primo still has... NHL magic in him. He's just in the wrong team, unfortunately. I think we gave him too much time or not enough time, but I think this organization is not for him. You know, there's some players who cannot be in a team. As soon as they leave that team, they're just a superstar after. I think this is one of the situations. So now what do we do? We have three goalies. We oh. all said that something's going to happen. We cannot finish this we're not going to continue this whole season with three active goalies that means one is being moved and we all know that it might be primo now playing tonight and the way he played he added a lot of value to his name tonight a lot yeah. of value now do you get rid of him or do we get rid of jake allen and have the multiple and primo fight is, the, is this organization willing to give Primo another chance? I know it's only one game, but he yeah. really showed some crazy ass potential tonight. It's that's such a good question, and it's one that that tears me like to bits because the way I'm seeing it, if Jake Allen continues playing like this, you finally have the opportunity to move him. It, like if he if he plays a, a handful more games like he did, especially in the last game. Uh, Ding dong, Edmonton Oilers calling. Uh, well, 
that's the calling, ringing the doorbell, whatever. <laughs> I'm, I'm confusing the two, but the, the Edmonton Oilers have had shit goaltending. They've had all sorts of issues. Are they going to be able to maybe move one of their goaltenders? They they probably also. Anyways, not about the Edmonton Oilers. I just say if Allen continues playing like this, I think it's maybe too good to be true and and a great opportunity to move him. Um, the part two of the answer is Samuel Montembeau didn't show up. It's Samuel Montabarnac who showed up this year, and he's been. I'm sorry to say, but the guy that we kind of poked I fun at and year. and. Yeah, and we we ridiculed in in previous years. Well, he he's it's sad to say, but to date, that's the guy from the beginning of training camp all the way to present date. The guy that we got was the unreliable. Don't know what you're gonna get. Might make a handful of good saves, but really not the best goaltending. That's the Sam Montembeau that we have right now. So if if look my in in my personal opinion. I think there's a better likelihood of Jake Allen playing well and getting traded. If not, um, I do see Caden Primo two, three, four more games like this. If they give him these opportunities, uh, I think a team is going to be worth is is going to find it worthwhile to listen and see what so that, it costs to pick him up. But that's that's my my concern now, right? Because you know. Before the season started, we all said it's going to be Allen and, and Montabo because the Montabo we've seen the last year and a half, right? Like, yes, last year was just he he progressed, he showed his value to this team, the Olympics. The guy was like, we all said it. We were we were having an argument of will Montabo be our number one goalie? Whereas two years ago we said this guy better fucking get traded for a bag of pucks, and now we're saying this guy's going to be our number one goalie. And we all said, okay, was it just um, a lucky season, right? And then the Olympics, the guy just was a superstar. And now we start out the season with three goalies, and we had this conversation in episode one or episode two. You know, Allen, like, we're going to add some value to Allen and, and get rid of him, and that's it. But now we're in a position where Montabo is not the Montabo we know that we saw last year. It's Montabo we saw two years ago where we want to trade him for a bag of pucks. We have Allen, who is playing amazing. Now, is he playing amazing because he's trying to add value to get traded? And now we have Primo. Who, okay, one game in, well, there, relax. But he played fantastic. Now, if you give two or three more games of Allen and he play, uh, sorry, Allen, two, more, two or three more games with Primo and he plays the same way he played tonight, Yep. what do you do now? Do you have a hot Allen, a Primo who's fucking showing what we all thought he's capable of doing, and you have a Montabo who's fucking declining again? What do you do now? The 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 sad truth is, I think if there's any goalie that we're gonna be stuck with at the end of the year, I no matter what, I I think we're gonna we're gonna be having Sam Montabo as part of the Montreal Canadiens roster. I don't think he's going. Um, the whether or not it's going to be Primo or Allen, I think that's going to be purely based off of how the severity of the injuries and how the team is going to perform leading up to the players' return. So let's say I think Caden Gooley is only like day to day, if if not week to week. I have no information. I do not want to make any declarations. But the fact that he's already back on the ice, I think it's just this Habs um, medical staff is being very cautious. They don't want to rush him back. They don't want to do anything before he's due to come back. So, you know, take your time, kid. And when when the time comes, when the time comes, uh, come back. And so I'm just saying if we're in a position that we're actually competitive, we're competing, we're playing well, I definitely think that there's a higher likelihood of Jake Allen staying. If we're going to just shit the bed, then I, I think there's actually maybe a chance – that Primo is going to be our guy who's going to be backing up. But see, but, see and... but now after, but okay. So we know that Allen is number right now, as it stands, the way the first six games, Allen is our goalie. He's our number one. Okay. But now there's that fight between San Montebo and Primo. And even though we had a big loss tonight, again, I don't point fingers at this guy. I don't think it's his fault whatsoever. Now, who's your backup? Is it Montabo or Allen? I guess time will tell. 
And again, I don't want to, I hope they don't make a, a rush decision yet. I hope they, you know, and again, I can't believe we're saying this because how many chances did we give Primo? Like we've given this guy so many chances to prove what he's like to prove himself and he never did it. And now he's one game in and he did, but is it, is it a tease? Is it a, yeah. I played good today, but tomorrow I'm not going to play well like Sam Montebo. Like, I, we need consistency. And I think Allen has proven that this year, so far in six games, that he has consistent record and he's going to, he's our number one. But I guess time will tell. Well, these are just speculations and, and predictions again and hope that Primo can be the Primo that we all saw, we all thought he was going to be. Or does he get traded and he becomes a fucking superstar goalie in another team like Edmonton or even New Jersey? You know, yeah, but uh, but that's that. So, before we end this off, I don't know if you wanted to finish anything about Primo. Uh, fingers crossed, man. <laughs> either, either I ho- I'm hoping for, I'm sorry for all the noise and checking back. I, I have literally, okay, we don't hear a psychotic anything. cat. It's he's a black cat, he's got orange eyes. I swear to god, he knows Halloween is coming. I swear, <laughs> he's he goes crazy at night. Uh, girlfriend's gone on a on a business trip too, so I'm completely alone. I wake up to this this little guy licking my forehead, and now he's going crazy with his toy. So I apologize for the uh, the lack of professionalism that uh, that has come uh, throughout this episode. No but professionalism with the curfew boys, where you just here to have fun. <laughs> but uh, on that front, like I said, I really hope the biggest problem that we've had with. Go, those two younger goaltenders, so Montembeau and uh, and particularly Primo, is there's been no consistency. You might get a flash of magic, and then it's it's over the next minute. I'm really, really, really. I think more than Montembeau, like right now, I genuinely don't give a shit how he plays, good, bad, average. Right now, if there's anybody who has to play really well, it it's got to be Primo. It has to be primo. So I'm hoping that all the points that you just made are come to fruition, and uh, and they become evidently same thing a reality. But if that actually if that actually ends up happening, then I I think the Montreal Canadiens are going to be in an extremely good spot at the trade deadline or before the deadline. Um, because again, much like you, I don't see a whole season where they're going to be splitting the time between three goaltenders. It's just no, nah, it's not. No, I happen. think by you know. Give it another month or two. Depends again. Depends on how these 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 goalies perform, right? Mm-hmm. And that's it. I want to just before we end this this episode, I just can't believe that this always fucking happens to us. But uh, there's always an ex hab who comes back and just haunts <laughs> us. You know, but- Tyler Toffoli fucking hat trick tonight at the Bell Center. It's like a fuck you to the, the, the team, right? Like, but it always happens to us. It's it's every time an ex player comes back to the Bell Center, they just ha- happen to be the fucking elite talent player. Even though they're not an elite player, mind you, I love Toffoli. You know, I, I, yeah. I was a big fan of Toffoli, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are. The moment you're an ex hab and you come back to the Bell Center, if you're a goalie <laughs> or you're a player or a fucking. A, uh, 99th pick, round draft pick, whatever you are, you just come if, if it's an equipment manager. Well, I know Montreal has been pretty steady in their equipment managers, but literally, if it would have been an equipment manager, it would have been one of those equipment managers who ended up making the assist on the plate to hand a broken stick, a fresh stick to the player, goes up the ice and scores. I know what you mean. It's like the return to Montreal curse against well, Montreal. Even, even, uh, I know we spoke about this in the episode. With um with Minnesota, but actually, come to think about it, um, hold on a second. I wanted to see one thing here. Come to think about it, we didn't even have an episode after the Minnesota game, so we didn't even talk about the Minnesota game. So that being said, about X Hab or or even a Montrealer, you come to this fucking building, and you are an elite player. Now we all know that Flurry is a good goalie. He, he's I'm not going to take that away from him. But at this age, at this time of his career where he's ready to retire, the guy is like done. His career is over. But he comes to Montreal 
and he plays one of the best games of his career. And 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 I'm not even and and better than the Stanley Cup Finals where he won the cup, better than when he played with Pittsburgh. He had a game of his lifetime here in Montreal. And yes, they 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 said that this could be his last game ever at the Bell Center. And he comes here again. It's a curse that we have at the Bell Center. I, you know what I think we should do? Hear me out here. Hear me out here. I think Gorton and Hughes tomorrow morning should trade the whole fucking team. Literally every single player. Just trade them all. Have a clause where you trade them all for one day. Forfeit the next game because we don't have players to play. And then re-sign them all back. And I guarantee you... They will all be elite players, all of them, because that's what happens when you get traded from the Montreal Canadiens and you go to another team. You're an elite player, and again, destined to perform. And all, and it doesn't have to be an ex-half player. It's, it's if you're a guy who was born in Montreal or in Quebec, and you have the roots here, like Fleury. You uh, add, it's, it's just a curse. One, have. Of, one of the most annoying guys, like in that sense in the past few years was Jean-Gabriel Pajot. That guy was invisible 90% of the time. Comes to, <laughs> comes to, but it's it, like you said, it's the same, it's the same fucking thing. You're Quebecois, you're from Montreal, English, French, doesn't really matter. Uh, they they even, fucking even third channel their inner Patrick Noir, they how many channel times? their inner fucking Guy Lafleur, Christ. But how many times it's, do we have third string goalies who would play their first NHL game here at the Bell Center and they get a shutout? How many times does that happen here? It's it's crazy. It's like what is it? Yeah, I think they're ghosts. They're literal like goalie ghosts. Like you have. Don't get me wrong. If you, historically speaking, Jacques Plante, Ken Dryden, Patrick Roy, and I'm gonna go as far as include. I, I absolutely think that that Carey Price has his name yeah. uh, as this. Has his, I 100% uh, agree, but but those guys, especially the first, the aforementioned three, I think that so many youngsters who who are now playing in the NHL who grew up here, like we know how important hockey is. We know what hockey means, and I swear to God, though, I, I feel as though they channel their inner for the goalies. They channel those guys, and for the players, they channel some of the stars that we that we grew up watching. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know. How they psych themselves up, I don't know what the hell, but like at a certain point in time, I think they're just possessed by the um, ghosts of Hab's past. And what? and you know what? Just on that note though, to Foley for the joy that he gave us in the and I know you're on the same page, but for the joy that he gave us on that Stanley Cup run, um, I think it's still a guy. I think he could have stayed here. I think he could have been the interim captain huh. before Suzuki. Mm-hmm. Fuck it, it. That was that was a trade that I didn't necessarily agree with. I, I sadly agree with that. Good on him for his hat trick tonight. No, I I'm, 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 I get that. Again, he's not a player that I hate. Just it it burned me a bit because it's like ex half player comes to Bell Center, scores three goals, and had to be an empty netter just to fucking you know nail the coffin a bit. But mm-hmm. um, whatever, it is what it is. On that note, um, Chris. It was a pleasure having an episode with you. Absolutely. The guys uh, were here. It goes spirit. both ways, buddy. The guys were here in spirit. They're going to be here on the next episode. Um, we will let you know on Instagram and on Facebook and on Twitter when our next episode is going to be. So follow us for more HAPS content. Listen to us on Spotify and on Apple Music and any other podcast platform you love to listen to. If you want to see our beautiful faces, please subscribe on YouTube. All right. Uh, please send us a review and a rating. We would love to hear what you think about us. Even if it's bad, we take constructive constructive critic. I can't even speak today. Constructive criticism. Oh my God, critic. Wow. Criticism. Criticism. Oh, oh, oh. Holy shit. <laughs> Criticism. What the hell is wrong with Okay, uh, cut. But uh, yeah, we accept it all. It's the only way we can help grow this podcast and give you guys an ama- amazing content. Um, next game is when, guys? I think it is. Let me check. Thursday. Thursday, Thursday against Columbus. Against the Columbus Blue Jackets. And then we have Saturday against the Jets. 
Chris, until next time. Bye now. Now. Good night.